for Russia, the, the, there are several layers of context for the current conflict in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there is global context, and this is very much about uh, world order, about rule, rules of the games, which were imposed by the West after the Cold War, and uh, which uh, are not satisfactory for Russia, as well as for many other countries in the world, uh, and which Russia has been trying to, uh, to kindly revise and kindly suggest to, to, to revise. And these uh, suggestions were, uh, were denied many times. And the very last time this was denied uh, this year uh, after Russia made, made its proposals to the United States and, and NATO. The second layer is uh, regional and uh, that is very much connected to, uh, to NATO and to the NATO exp ex expansionistic uh, policy. For long, there was the argument that, uh, that NATO, that it is not that NATO is expanding, it is that new members join NATO. And that's why, because other countries want to join NATO, NATO should keep the doors open so that nobody is, is denied the freedom of choosing uh, alliances. However, uh, that argument was probably true for, for, for the 90s, uh, but that is not true uh, from the mid-2000 uh, years, in particular from 2008, from the Bucharest summit, because the Bucharest summit was a sort of threshold uh, when we clearly saw that uh, the United States are pushing some countries to join NATO. Uh, I want to remind you that Bucharest summit uh, history in, in the spring of 2008, uh, nobody was going to, to provide the membership action plan for Ukraine and, and Georgia. In the end of 2007, all European countries were saying that the issue is out of question. Ukraine and Georgia were not ready. Um, that was too controversial issue and, and so on and so on. And suddenly in January 2008, we saw how uh, Kandaliza Rice started very active campaign going around Europe and pushing everyone to support the, 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 the membership action, uh, action plan. And even these countries themselves, they were pushed to uh, intensify efforts. Although that time there was no consensus, even in the elite of those countries, let alone among population for membership in, uh, in, in NATO. So it was very clear uh, sign that these countries <laughs> are pushed into NATO. And the only reason to push them was geopolitical and partly ideational to, uh, to, to make the clear c signal that, uh, look, Russia, uh, these uh, countries are beyond uh, your zone of influence. Forget it as part of your Russian, uh, of your Russian culture. Uh, and since then, uh, NATO continued to, to expand. Ukraine and Georgia issue was always on, uh, on, on, on the agenda. And we saw how in the recent uh, years, uh, the Ukrainian elite has been trying to, to intensify this uh, issue together with the United States. And uh, the next layer is, uh, is also regional and to some extent uh, bilateral between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, and that is the, uh, the layer of the Minsk agreements, which was supposed to, uh, to give resolution to the uh, Ukrainian crisis of, of 2014. How, however, and, and the, uh, the provisions of, of the Minsk agreements, the second, so-called the first and the second uh, Minsk agreements were very simple. Uh, the provisions were to reintegrate uh, the east uh, of Ukraine into Ukraine, but on terms which would provide uh, the population uh, in the east to have rights to speak uh, 
uh, Russian language, to have uh, education in Russian, uh, to, have, uh, to have access to the Russian uh, culture, and at the same time, to have a free political expression inside uh, inside Ukraine. So they were supposed to get uh, guarantees, constitutional guarantees uh, for, uh, for their identity. However, we saw that uh, Ukraine did not implement those uh, Minsk agreements. Actually, they said very clearly in the end of the last year and in the beginning of this year that uh, Minsk agreements are dead. Uh, and uh, the very uh, negative surprise for Russia was that Western countries, which were supposed to, to be guarantors of these Minsk agreements, they just said, okay, if they don't want to implement them, then what? Uh, and uh, it, it was really a strange, uh, a strange move. Russia was providing various, uh, various evidence uh, of Ukraine uh, violating and sabotaging the Minsk agreements. Uh, and the response from France and Germany was that, yeah, probably that's true, but, but then what? Uh, we, we are not going to, to do anything on them and they, and, and they did not extend any pressure on, on Ukraine for the implementation of, uh, of, uh, of agreements. Besides that, uh, the Russian uh, military uh, and the Russian uh, diplomatic service uh, provide a very strong statement that besides all that, Ukraine was uh, preparing uh, a, an op a military operation against uh, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk uh, republics, against the eastern territories, uh, which uh, declared their independence in uh, the eastern territories of Ukraine, which declared their uh, independence in 2014 and received uh, some support from uh, Russia to, uh, to, to, uh, to survive the Ukrainian uh, military effort uh, against, uh, against them. Uh, so all that came together, uh, finally, this global context of uh, world order, uh, or actually world disorder, the, the regional context of NATO, the collapse of the Minsk agreements, and, uh, uh, and absolute, uh, important, absolutely uh, strange position of the Western countries of, of the Ukrainian denial of the Minsk agreements. And besides that, uh, the evidence uh, which uh, the Russian military and the Russian diplomatic service insists on that Ukraine was uh, preparing a, a, a some sort of military operation against uh, its uh, formerly eastern, uh, formerly its eastern ter ter territories. So uh, for Russia, for Russia. Um, it, this uh, military operation looks like a forced operation, like we had no other choice but, uh, but to do it. And uh, Russia, I think, was preparing for, for sanctions, but nobody was expecting that sanctions would be exactly of this uh, depth, of this scale, of this scope. Um, I think it became... Uh, it became a sort of uh, a sort of surprise, but that is very telling issue that uh, we received sanctions of this uh, of this scope uh, and of this magnitude. The issue is that uh, from Russian perspective, um, we had to make the the, the invasion. Uh, we had to start this uh, special military operation, but we take it as something we do not like. We do not glorify the military operation. We have to do it. We would like it to be as limited as possible, uh, but, uh, but that is not something very special in, uh, in the international relations. Use of force is not so exceptional. Uh, we had uh, many examples of use of force by the United States and by its uh, allies, uh, Yugoslavia, Kosovo, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Syria. By the way, we should not forget that right now in Syria, there is a, an American, uh, an American uh, military presence, which is absolutely illegal. 
the official government of Syria is uh, did not invite the U.S. military presence in Syria, but uh, the U.S. controls part of the Syrian territory and exploits uh, part of the Syrian oil uh, resources. Uh, it produces oil, it sells oil, and this military presence uh, of the United States in Syria is absolutely out of the international uh, international law. So against the background of all that. Uh, from the Russian perspective, this uh, military operation should be seen in the context of other uh, projection of, uh, uh, of military force uh, outside of, uh, of national territories. And we have many examples of them. Russia was always against it. Uh, but we came to the point when probably we have to do it, uh, to do it ourselves. Uh, however, the, the, the Western world portrays this in absolutely different light. They say that Russia did something exceptionally, exceptionally wrong. Uh, they, they portray it as if there were no other invasions. But I can tell you what actually they share with us when we speak to them uh, on the Chatham House uh, ground. On the Chatham House ground, they say that, uh, look, we, 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 we understand we were wrong in Iraq, in, in, uh, in Libya. We, we understand that, yes, in Syria, it's also uh, illegal. But we would like that to be exceptional, uh, to be exceptional, uh, exception from rules. And we do not want you to have the right uh, for, for, that, uh, for that exception. And uh, for Russia, that is a very strange position. You either have go common, common rules or you, you do not have uh, or you have no common rules. Um, the, the issue that uh, some countries have more rights than, uh, than other countries, when somebody has the right for exceptional use of force and others do not have the right for the exceptional use of, of force, that is absolutely unacceptable for Russia. Second, what Russia sees is that uh, Ukraine was used as a pretext to actually escalate the, 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 the essentially geopolitical conflict into a global uh, economic conflict. Uh, Ukraine in this case is used as a sort of uh, sacrifice. Ukraine is actually sacrificed. I pay your attention to the fact that Ukraine, despite all statements, various statements of assistance, of help and so on, Ukraine does not receive much help from the West, practical help. They receive a lot of encouragement. They receive some weapons so that they could continue, uh, so that they could increase the price of uh, conflict for, for, for Russia. But they are used as, uh, I would say, uh, as a geopolitical shahid. They are sacrificed. Uh, their mission is to suffer, to suffer publicly, to yell and scream. And on this basis, uh, the, the West imposed uh, very uh, drastic sanctions against, uh, against, uh, against Russia. And these sanctions, they actually shift the conflict from its geopolitical basis to, uh, to an absolutely different, uh, different level. The conflict uh, has uh, global economic effects on developed countries, on Europe and the United States. The, the life there for middle class will become tougher. And uh, the change of life of the middle class may trigger social uh, transformations, in, in particular social transformation uh, toward uh, the, the rise of, uh, of the radical right, which has been already discussed. Uh, there may be other uh, ways of social transformation, but uh, we will see that uh, there will be crisis of the middle class in, in, uh, in developed countries with potentially uh, important uh, social transformation. But even more effects will be for the developing world, for the global south, uh, because uh, lack of uh, agriculture uh, products is is going to be a, a very uh, serious uh, issue. Interruption of production and trade uh, chains that is also going to be a very uh, a very important uh, a very important issue. 
uh, I think that Russia uh, did not want this, uh, this escalation uh, from geopolitical uh, level to the global economic level. But Russia, ex Russia actually receives this uh, challenge and Russia uh, appreciates very much that half of the world economy, countries representing half of the world economy, half of the world GDP, did not impose uh, sanctions on Russia, uh, even under the risk of being sanctioned for not imposing sanctions. That is, uh, when we try to look rationally at it, we see that, that it is extraordinary hypocrisy. Countries are threatened to be sanctioned for not imposing sanctions against Russia. There is no, you know, they say that Ukraine should have freedom to, cho to choose alliances, but nobody is left freedom to, 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 for, for sovereign decisions to impose sanctions or not impose sanctions. Countries are threatened to, 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 to fall under sanctions for not uh, uh, making sanctions against uh, Russia. That is extreme, uh, extreme hypocrisy. Um, and uh, by the way, for Russia, it is important, and, and we do not raise that point very loudly, but it is important why the West takes, uh, uh, the, why, why the West portrays the, the, the conflict in Ukraine and the Russian invasion as something exceptionally, exceptionally wrong and uh, takes its invasions uh, in other places as just, okay, that is, that is a mistake, that is exception, but we would like uh, this uh, to, be, to be tolerated. There is only one, well, we can explain it with hypocrisy, but, but because that is repeated hypocrisy, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to, we, we either should think that, look, interests and moral in the West uh, do not exist uh, together. They are just fully separ separated. Or we may have another explanation for that, that there is extremely deeply sitting uh, sense of racism, which actually means that you can kill non-whites. Yeah, uh, well, that is bad, but you can kill non-whites. But those whom we consider white, you should not kill. That is just out of question totally. And Ukraine is, uh, is, 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 is taken uh, by the West as a sort of, uh, a sort of bites. Although I repeat again, I think that is not true because actually Ukraine is geopolitically sacrificed. Uh, uh, nobody is going to integrate Ukraine into the, global, uh, into the global West. The only purpose of Ukraine is to become the pretext of uh, moving the, the conflict from, from the geopolitical level to the, ge to the global geoeconomic level. How all that can be summarized from the research perspective? My summary is this, the West, or the two big factions of the West, the liberal and the, uh, and the real politique faction of the West. They are pushing us to the unacceptable choice between security and, and development. Actually, what the liberal uh, camp of the West tells us, it, tell, it, it tells us you all get economic benefits from globalization. Your socioeconomic models are based on being, uh, being uh, part of globalization, of participating in globalization. So if you want to continue that, forget about your own interpretations of security, forget about sovereignty, just use globalization on our, on our terms. What the real politique faction of the West uh, tells us, it tells us, look, yeah, we understand that uh, you are politically sovereign. Uh, you have the right for security, but then, sorry, you will not be able to use uh, globalization. So the choice is either be yourself, but be poor, or be richer, but do not be yourself. Uh, I think that is the, the first, this conflict, uh, this geoeconomic global conflict we have now against Russia, that is, uh, from the research perspective, the first example when the West uh, openly presents this choice. Choose between security and economic development. And I believe that many other countries are going to face this choice. We've been facing it in a sort of 
uh, converted way, not an open way. But now we are presented with that choice in, uh, in the open way, security or development. And I think that uh, Russia, as well as uh, China, Brazil, and many other countries, we are not going to accept this choice. We need both security and, uh, and economic development. And it's not the issue that we are fighting for something only, for only one part of it. We are fighting against the very tough choice the West is, uh, is pushing us uh, to. Thank you for your attention.